there's a lot of laughter going on in here. <laughs> huh, what's going on? Let me introduce myself. My name is Valentine. I lived in Rome during the third century. That was a long, long time ago. At that time, Rome was ruled by a very cruel emperor. His name was Claudius, Claudius the Cruel. I didn't like Emperor Claudius, and I wasn't the only one. A lot of people shared my feelings. Claudius wanted a really, really big army. He expected men to volunteer. However, many men didn't really want to join the army. They didn't want to fight in wars. They didn't want to leave their wives and their families. As you might have guessed, not too many men showed up and signed up. Well, this really ticked Claudius off. So what happened? He got this crazy idea. He said, I'm just going to ban marriages. If they're not married, they'll join the army. So that's what he set up was a law saying, no more marriages. People thought this was really, really cruel, and it was. I thought it was preposterous, and I wasn't going to support that law. Did I mention that I was also a priest? And one of my favorite activities was to marry couples. So guess what I did? I continued to have quiet, secret marriages. I continued to marry couples. It was quite exciting, you can imagine. In a small, dark room with a little candlelight, the couple together giving their vows, and I performing the ceremony, all the while listening for those footsteps. And one day, the footsteps came. Oh my God, it was the soldiers who were coming. And fortunately, the couple that I was marrying, they ran and they got away. Unfortunately, I was caught. Not quite as light on my feet as I used to be. So I got thrown in jail, and my punishment was death. Now, I tried to stay cheerful, and folks that were supporting me and loving me for what I did and standing up to the emperor, they would come to my jail cell, and they would throw flowers and notes in through the bars of the windows. There was a man who was the prison guard, and he, he had a daughter, and he allowed his daughter to come in. And the daughter would come in, and we would talk for hours, and she really kept my spirits up because she believed what I was doing was right. Then it came the day that I was to be executed, and I left her a note of my care and my love, and I signed it from your Valentine. This was in 269 AD. Now, what's interesting is that this note started this tradition called Valentine's Day. It was written on the day I died, February 14th, 269 AD. Now, every day on this year, people still remember that love and friendship is to be honored and celebrated and stood up for. And whenever they think of Claudius, emperor, they just laugh and say, they know that you can't beat love because love always wins. Yeah, right? Right? <laughs> so there you have it, the story of Valentine. And I'm going to release this part of my joyful experience. Um, yeah, only because it's, it's, well, it's fun for sure. <laughs> but yeah, a little, little less of that. So actually, the practice of Valentine's Day started prior to Valentine's death, demise, and such. Back in the pagan days, there was a goddess of marriage named Juno. And what they did back in those pagan days is they had a box, and the boys, the girls would put their names in the box. The boys would take a name out, and then they would have that would be their girl, 
who they would get to know and they would exchange gifts. And it came in the 1800s, I believe they would take the name out and pin it on their sleeve. So you've all heard this phrase, wearing your heart on your sleeve. Interesting things, right? That you want to know about on Valentine's Day. So uh, there are various types of love, which you may already know, but this is a little uh, backdrop. You have eros, or uh, eros love or amor love, which is that romantic love, which is what Valentine's Day is all about, that romance. Then you have another type of love, which is called stor storge love. Storge love is the love of family, the love of a mom for a child or a dad for its child. and It's, fam fami it's that family love, storge love. The next type of love is called fili, fili, um, fili, fili, filia. Yeah, filia, filia. I got it. Like Philadelphia, right? It's, it's, it is, because that that's where it comes from. Filia love is the love that you have for your friends and for folks that are um, in the same thing that you are in, so you have love for them. Then you all know that the biggest love of all is called Agape love, right? Agape love, which is that love that gives without wanting to receive, any need to receive. It just gives because it's the spirit of love to love and to not expect anything back in return, but just because love is the nature of beingness. Now, the truth is, we are that love. We are agape love. And yet, we sometimes don't act that way, right? Uh, am I being 100% uh, agape love? Heck no, I'm more conditional love. And we spoke last week about love for no... Very good, love for no reason. That is that agape love. Now, I gave two homework assignments. Now, here's your test. Did you do your homework? Yes, mm-hmm. Uh, the, the homework, does anybody remember what it was? Yeah, that's what I, mm -hmm. that's, it's okay, because I give second chances, okay? You are to set your love for no reason intention, because if you don't write your intention, you will never have the fulfillment. So it's not too late. You can still write your love for no reason intention. What would the world look like? For me, my, my affirmation, I did my homework, <laughs> and that is that, um, now what is it? <laughs> my intention, love for no reason. I love with an open heart, and I bring love to every person and situation that I am with or encounter. So I bring unconditional love as an open heart to all that I am with. The second part, there was two parts, so I know you're all writing your intentions now. Again, writing that down. Then next, to spend a couple minutes a day to envision it. What does the world look like to, for you when we're all loving from that agape love, that love for no reason? That makes me smile. My heart smiles. I smile when I get that vision. And that's what we want to generate, is that vibration. You can listen to what I come in here, I say on Sundays, but are you engaging in the practice? It's what makes the difference. And it's good wherever you are and whatever you choose to do, but I'm encouraging you to take that step forward into experiencing more of that love and bringing it into the world because it starts inside of us. So today's talk, we, I've mentioned those four types of love, but there is something that is even greater. The greatest love of all. Would you like to know what it is? Yep, okay, I'll tell you afterwards. <laughs> the greatest love of all. Actually, you know the song? You have, do you know the song, The Greatest Love of All? Yes. And it's about, it's easy to achieve. The greatest love of all is learning to love ourselves. It's the greatest love of all, Whitney Houston's song. And previously it was whose song? George Benson. 
George Benson song. See, he knows, and he, Bill's awesome in knowing things. So I was going to call today's service the greatest love of all, because that's what we're going to talk about. However, thinking about Super Bowl Sunday today, and then we have Valentine's Day tomorrow, and I thought, okay, change it to the Super Bowl of love. Yeah, I can combine it. Well, then I did rapping with the Rev, and I had three folks on there, and somebody goes, oh, and we have the Olympics. And I'm like, oh, that's right. So one of the three brought this one, and I said, I like it. It's the Super Bowl gold medal of love. You got them all. So would you all like a gold medal in the Super Bowl of love? Yes. Yeah, right on. So that's what we're doing today, and it's that self-love. Now, there is something that often stands in the way of being that with ourselves, that self-love. Would you like to know what it is? Well, we all have it, and it comes out, and sometimes it's stronger than others. I'm going to call it the I see. Inner critic. Oh, I see. Inner critic. Anybody under, uh, familiar with the inner critic? Yeah. The, the three parts of the inner critic, it likes to compare, compete, and the best one of all, criticize, right? <laughs> well, what I got to say about comparison comes from Dr. Jim Terrell, minister, mentor of mine. He said, the only sin there is, is comparison. Okay, got it? <laughs> comparison? Uh-huh, the word sin is in there. So I know you all got that. You're all cracking up online. They're all like looking at me like, what? Co comparison. To compare ourselves to others is ridiculous, and yet we do it. And our society teaches us to compare and then to compete. And then when we don't measure up to others, then the inner critic jumps in there and tells you, you're not good enough. You can't do that. You're stupid. You're lazy. You name it. You know, the inner critic shows up. And it shows up sometimes in spades. And mine shows up usually when I'm tired, <laughs> you know, because I don't have the resilience. And if I'm feeling tired, you make a mistake, it's like throw yourself under the bus. Anybody? Anybody here You've done that? It's like, okay, how's that working as unconditional love? See, we can make mistakes and be unlovable and do things that are maybe a little bit on the stupid side, maybe big stupid, I don't know. But to not love myself is actually worse than the mistake that I made. My judgment, my self-judgment and criticism is worse than anything else. The divine which is agape love, it all it wants to do is love and because it can't do anything else. It loves me regardless of my behaviors. It loves me regardless of what I think. It only loves me. And my goal in life is to learn to love Liz. Love myself as much as spirit loves me. I remember thinking at age 19 when I was at a Christian college and I thought, God loves me. And it was like, so what? What I realized was God loves me, but it didn't matter. I didn't love me. It was a big awakening for me to realize I wasn't loving myself. And guess what? My opinion was more important than God's. And if we look at unity principles, who is God? I am. It's a, a little twisted, but do you realize in, in, the, in the scriptures, the two greatest commandments, the first one is to love God with all your might, with all your heart, with all your soul. Now, if we say in unity, which we do, our principle number one and two is God, the divine spirit is all there is. And I am one with God is principle number two. I am the divine in expression, a unique individualized expression of spirit. So the first commandment is to love the Lord, love yourself with all your might, heart, and soul. Think about that. That was the first time I actually thought about this was yesterday. It was like, oh, so I'm going to love myself. And then the second one 
is to love others as you love yourself, which is talk next week. So I'll save you for that one. So here's the thing, that inner critic, where does it come from? It comes from our upbringing. It comes from parents who don't mean perhaps to be mean, and maybe they do, you know. It's, there's this upbringing, and we get messages by teachers, by society, that you're to this, you can't do that, you're stupid, you don't have what it takes, you can't really do that. You get all this negative stuff, and then the outer critics don't matter anymore because I got the inner critic. My dad, I had the voice of my dad. One of the inner critic's voices to me was, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Especially when I was a teenager, because I was doing all kinds of things. <laughs> what's wrong with you? And I wanted to say, what's wrong with you? Or, what's right with me? So we get these inner meanies. How do you deal with that inner meanie? is the question. And I'm going to give you the ABCs because don't you love the fact that you got the ABCs and you know the alphabet and I doubt that you really ever forget the alphabet because it's so ingrained. So the ABCs, and you can take notes if you wish on how to deal with your inner critic, is first of all be aware. A, to be aware. And in the awareness, the two things, first of all, name your inner critic. When that meanie shows up, give it a name, meanie mo, you know, lazy, lazy meanie or whatever. I just call it IC, inner critic. But it's give it a name because it, it recognizes that's not the truth of you. It's that part of you that you're dealing with. It gives you some separation instead of just beating yourself. It's like, oh, there's that inner meanie again. I also like to wear a rubber band. I have a little red rubber band on. The rubber band, see, my goal is to go through an entire day, week, year, lifetime, never having an inner critic. And when my inner critic shows up, I take the rubber band and I turn it to the other hand. And I want to go through the day and never have moved it to the other hand. That's one way to be in your awareness. Okay, so you got your A. You're aware of this inner critic. Number two, you've got your B. Be curious, okay? You want to be curious. And the curious part is to ask, what does it, what is it trying to do for you? Because every aspect of our being has a purpose. What is it trying to do for you? I want you to say that. What is it trying to do for me? What is it trying to do for me? Because it's trying to do something. Often it's trying to protect us often. It wants to protect me or help me be better than what I was. It wants to protect me from stepping out and making a mistake or doing something wrong. So it keeps me small. It thinks it's giving me a gift by doing this criticism. Might want to keep me from rejection. But it really doesn't have a good job description. It, it, it thinks that it's doing the job and it's doing a job but in a very nasty way. So. Now that I'm curious and I've asked, what are you here for? What are you trying to do for me, not against me? That's huge. Then you go to C, caring compassion. We thank the inner critic for its information. It gave me something valuable that I didn't know because you have to listen. You will hear something if you take that time. So we thank the inner critic for its contribution. We don't want to make it go away. It has something to contribute. So we say thank you, caring compassion. This part is trying to do something just in a very odd, odd way. Then we go to D. D, declare what's good about you. And one of my affirmations I like to use is I'm loved, I am lovable, I am loving. I am love. Okay, so I want you to listen and then repeat after me. I am loved. 
I am lovable. I am loving. I am love. That's very, very powerful if you want to create that state of energy for who you are and, and to know that you are that. We have to change the programs in our head. Now we've got D, now we're going to go to E. Embrace your inner critic. And this is what I used to do. I'd eat a whole carton of ice cream when I worked at the group home for abused and neglected kids. I'd eat, I don't know, I had a bit of an eating issue. I did attend OA for a while. I was using food, especially when I was tired or I needed. And I learned to say, I love you anyway. Everybody do this. I love you anyway. You don't have to love the behaviors that are upsetting to you because you are not your behavior. You're a lovable being who just made an interesting choice, right? So to love yourself by embracing, I love you anyway, because what will kill me worse is my judgment will kill me more than, oh, and I used to smoke cigarettes as well, so when I would break down and I would think that I quit and I'd smoke cigarettes, I'd be like, I love you anyway. Well, I'll tell you what, the judgment would kill me um, more severely and than the judgment. And F is the last one in your sixth part of alphabet, is to forgive. To forgive ourselves. And I have a line, I like to keep things really simple. This forgiveness exercise is the line, I forgive myself, say that, <laughs> for judging myself as whatever, because the truth is, I'm awesome. <laughs> so you can use, and use that phrase, I forgive myself for eating the ice cream and thinking and judging myself as being undisciplined, lazy, bad, because the truth is I'm a child of the divine and who I am is awesome and amazing. So bringing that forgiveness, because it's the forgiving the judging of ourselves. We've got to let go of that judge because it's a meanie and I don't need to have that meanie running my life. I want to go into that greatest love of all. So, in closing, I do have a little story about Chad. Oh, no, I have something before that. Spirit always goes tap, tap, tap. And there's something else. It's Valentine's Day tomorrow. You know that. I know that. And last week I said something about the affirmation of, I'm the world's greatest... There you go. And, and I'm the world's greatest lover, and so are you. So as the world's greatest lover, what are you doing for you for Valentine's Day? I challenge you to go out and buy a Valentine's Day card for yourself. Seriously. You buy a Valentine's Day card for yourself. And then write a love note about how awesome you are. You can write just a love letter. You can make yourself a card. Do something, and you can sign it, the universe of love <laughs> to yourself because you are the valentine. You're the greatest lover, and you are the beloved. And to give to ourselves, I also would encourage you to make a list of all the ways that you could self-love. Getting a massage, buying yourself flowers, getting yourself a nice meal. What is it? Make a list today or tomorrow. And then every morning you wake up and you go, what's on the list that I could do, I'm going to do today that's self-loving, right? This doesn't need to be a one-day deal. You're the valentine of your life, of spirit. So to bring that in, I personally did this uh, a while back in time, and I bought myself a little bear. He did have a heart that had candy in it, and it was strapped in. But this is my little bear that I got on Valentine's Day that I bought with a card, and he's now my um, co-pilot in the car. Yeah, so this is Teddy, and he has been with me for about 20 years, so he's looking pretty good, right? So, 
So there you go. There is Teddy because I purchased things for myself. It's Valentine's Day. So I'm going to tell you now in closing the story of Chad. And I'm going to find the story of Chad just as my backup. Because it's always nice to have a backup. And it's um, about Chad. Chad it was a little boy, very shy. Very shy, didn't have any friends. And he, one day he came home and he goes, Mom, I'm going to make Valentine's cards for everybody in the class. And she said, I wish he wouldn't do that. Because she'd watch the other children when they come home from school and they were always hanging on each other and skipping and walking. And he always walked by himself alone behind them. He was never, ever included. Nevertheless, she decided to go along with her son. So she bought the paper, the glue, the crayons. And for three weeks, Chad made these Valentine's Day cards. So when Valentine's Day came, Chad was so excited, he put the Valentines in a bag, and he stacked them up, and he bolted out the door. Well, Mom is really fearful, and she says, I'm going to make some warm cookies and milk because I'm so afraid he's going to come home and he's not going to be given any Valentine's Day cards, and he will be so disappointed and I'm going to try and ease his pain when he doesn't get any, because that's probably what's going to happen. So that afternoon, she had the warm cookies and the milk ready, and she heard the kids coming down the street, and sure enough, the kids were all together, and there's Chad walking behind them. And he comes in, and she was afraid that he was just going to burst into tears when he walked in. So he burst in through the door, and she said, here you go, here's your milk and cookies. Well, he walked right past her, and he goes, not a one, not a one. Her heart sank. Chad said, not a one. I didn't forget a single one. <laughs> that, to me, demonstrates Chad had self-love. He wasn't needing anything. He had enough self-love that all he cared about was to give. We have that same nature to give, but it has to come from that place of self-love. It's the greatest love of all. May we all take that self-love and do the practices, make the list, tame that inner critic. Know that the greatest love of all is learning to love yourself. The greatest love of all is who you are. Mm -hmm. Namaste. Namaste.